great to see so many people interested in what's happening in the bay in terms of the reefs, with our kelp forests, with sea urchins. Um, I'm sure many of you that are here tonight have been in the water, been observing some of this. And so, yeah, hopefully I can do some of the research that we've been doing over the last 10 plus years, a bit of justice, uh, to kind of take you into, yeah, what we've been finding out along the way. It's cool. Okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna do my best to cover what's kind of, yeah, 10 plus or so years that we've been working on trying to understand the reefs in the bay, what's been happening with kelp and with sea urchins. Um, when I did first write this talk, there was about 60, 70 plus slides. <laughs> and so I had to cull, cull, cull uh, to get, okay, what are the key messages to get through? So there's been a lot that's been going on in this space. Um, and so hopefully I hit the, the kind of most uh, important things to get across to you guys. But I think all of those other things, I think will be things that will pop up or questions that you might have. Um, so we might've already done some other bits of research on, on questions that, that, that you do have. And I'll touch on some things very briefly, but then maybe we can also discuss a bit more in the, in the questions and answers. Okay, uh, so th first I just thought I'd introduce you to um, what is the current uh, Golden Kelp Reef Restoration Project Team. Um, so we have Professor Steve Swearer and Dean Chamberlain from the University of Melbourne, uh, Scott and Simon, and Simon from the Nature Conservancy, uh, myself, Prue, and Jackie, and Desmond and Kayla from Deakin, working on the kelp cultivation side of things. Uh, and then we've got Jill and Michael and, and, and Emily as well, a whole lot of other Park Victoria rangers working um, in managing urchins in the marine parks. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just wanted to give a shout out to the whole rest of the team, most of who are here this evening. So, um, yeah, you can spot the faces in the crowd. Okay, so first off is, well, yeah, want to give a little bit of a shout out to kelp, um, which is what we're all here to talk about today. This actually isn't from the bay. Uh, this is actually from a uh, from Beware Reef out in eastern Victoria. I think it's just getting us in the mood, just getting us in the vibe. So, yeah, kelp forests and marine uh, forests are really amazing. They provide this three-dimensional structure and habitat. And you get a whole lot of fish and all of the things that then live in amongst it. Um, that particular one there is called crayweed, you know, so we, we, we recognise that these seaweeds are really important for the fish and fisheries and things that we all like to eat or depend on or like to go and see. Um, and so it's really important to remember that, yeah, these kelp forests are amazing for biodiversity. Charles Darwin wrote about them, how amazing they are, that you wouldn't, that, you know, there's so many species in these kelp forests um, and, you know, compared them to the Amazon rainforest and everything. And but if we lose them, you know, there'd be so many species that would be impacted because they just uh, create this amazing home and environment for them. These are a bunch of pictures from species you might find in kelp forests uh, in the bay, but also around Victoria. Um, abalone and lobsters, um, as well as, yeah, some really amazing other snails and nudibranchs, cave, and uh, as well as a whole lot of other fish. And so, yeah, if you get in the water and you've been in these kinds of places, you will have seen all of these fish. And so, yeah, they're really important for biodiversity, but then for things like fisheries and, yeah, for, for recreation and tourism, um, which is why, you know, when we have a talk uh, about kelp, we get so many interested people coming along because they are really important. <coughs> So important that, you know, we have the Great Barrier Reef up north, but we now have dubbed the Great Southern Reef, which is all along the southern coast of Australia, um, where we have these golden kelp forests and other kelp forests. Um, and there's, yeah, that we've, we, we, yeah, so we've got the Great Southern Reef as well. So, um, yeah, really important ecosystem. Now, uh, this is a photo from, from Port Phillip Bay. Um, so the kelps look a little bit different, but I just thought I'd start with a little bit of uh, community uh, participation. So hands up those that have been diving or snorkeling in Port Phillip Bay, just at all, whether it's around a pier or something. Yeah, awesome. So most people have. Okay, cool. And hands up if you've been somewhere and you've seen a reef or a place that looks a little bit like this. You've got kelp or other seaweeds that are on there. Yeah, so most people are getting on to reefs as well. Okay, awesome. Um, so then the next slide. Okay. Now, hands up if you have also been swimming around Port Phillip Bay and you've seen a reef or somewhere that looks like this. Wow. So, yeah, most people that have been getting out in the water, seen kelp, have also seen areas like this. And it is really confronting. Um, you know, some of these areas are quite large. Um, and some of you may have witnessed areas go from kelp 
to a reef or a state like this. Um, and so uh, these areas are called sea urchin barrens, um, and the name is reasonably obvious. Uh, so they're barren, they're devoid of any large big macroalgae, kelps or other seaweeds, and we have a lot of sea urchins on them. Um, so I'll be using the term sea urchin, sea urchin barrens, sometimes just barrens, um, I'm a fair bit tonight. When we refer to these kinds of places um, where we've lost uh, a lot of the kelp and we have a lot of sea urchins. So the things are, sorry, I need to make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. So I think the main question that comes, well, both to me the first time I saw these kinds of places, but also I'm sure to many of you as you've swum over these reefs, um, is really around this question of, is this natural? Is this something I should be worried about? Um, and, and then so it goes kind of that question as well as, well, should we be doing something about this? So, um, so if it's natural, then maybe we don't need to worry. But actually, if it's not, if we think this is a problem, then maybe we should be doing something to actually help these reefs out. And so those are actually two quite loaded questions. There's actually a lot you need to dig into and understand about the system and how it's operating to get to the point where we might be able to answer these kind of two big overarching questions. Um, and so these are the questions that we kind of have posed and have looked into over the last 10 plus years to try and address these questions. Uh, so the first one is really about this historical change. So have these sea urchin barrens, have these places existed in the past? Are they the same as they were or are they expanding? Um, and that's kind of a really important one around that natural context. Is this just something that, you know, these barrens pop up? And then the kelps recover and it kind of flips between these two states and that's just a natural part of the dynamic or is it something that's changed a bit more um, and then it's also a little bit about is this widespread is this just something that's happening on a couple of little sites um, or is this something that's actually happening bay-wide and something that uh, is then a much larger impact that, <coughs> that we might be worried about and then it's really about what's driving these changes what are the things that might be causing a reef to shift from kelp to these sea urchin barrens and then finally, if we've answered all of those questions, then can we do something to actually help these reefs out? So <clears throat> jumping in our time machine. So uh, yeah, getting, getting uh, Marty McFly and Doc on board. So did these urchin barrens exist in the past? And we're really lucky. I talk about 10 plus years of research, but um, we're really lucky. There's actually been research going onto reefs in the bay, you know, just like Peter was talking about some of his work back, uh, back in the day. Um, that there was actually surveys of the seaweeds on these reefs, um, this one here in particular out at Williamstown back in the 70s. Um, and so this is just one particular example that I've pulled out um, and from some work that John Lewis and Chris O'Brien did on these reefs. And not only did, yeah, did they do the surveys, but they also drew this amazing picture of what the reef there at Williamstown looked like from, you know, going from the closest part to shore there at zero metres all the way on the left, uh, and then swimming out. So they swam these kind of 120 metre long transects. And they were really uh, detailed in their, um, in what they were counting in terms of all the different seaweed species. And then they drew this picture, which I really loved. <laughs> um, and in terms of some of the names of things here, probably the main one to point out is uh, this one here, a clonia radiata. So that's the golden kelp. And it's, um, so you can see they've drawn it on a whole bunch of the reef out here. But I think the other point to make is it wasn't just the golden kelp. There's a whole lot of other brown seaweeds in there, greens and reds. It's this really diverse community of seaweeds. Um, and so th this is a bit of artistic license because this obviously isn't a photo from the 70s, but this is almost what I imagine a little bit that reef to be like. So we have, you know, the main golden kelp here, but then we've got our greens and our reds and other brown seaweeds in there. So that's kind of what that picture in those surveys were showing were on that reef back at Williamstown in the 70s. So then when I went back, so I actually went back there with John Lewis and we laid out the transects in exactly the same place. Uh, and this is what we saw. So we are seeing these big changes in areas that used to be kelp, used to be amazing. And now they're these sea urchin barrens and they've stayed this way for about the last 10 years or so. So we're not seeing it flip back in between. We're getting this kind of irreversible, um, yeah, this change that's happened and it's not flipping back uh, to that kelp or seaweed dominated state. Um, so I was also really lucky. Um, there's uh, an, an aerial imagery archive um, sitting, out at, sitting out at Laverdon. Um, so I went out there, looked through some of the old aerial images. This is that same site at Williamstown. 
And these three red lines show the transects that, that John Lewis and Chris O'Brien did back in the 70s. So I've kind of overlay that from the image from the 1970s. Uh, we see patches of sand here in the yellow. Um, and this green line, so all of this is that seaweed covered reef. Um, and so we see that's most of the reef. But interestingly, uh, this, um, this section here is actually a few little patches of sea urchin barrens. And so even though they, they didn't fall in the transects that John and Chris did, um, just chatting with them, they were like, oh, yeah, if you swim out even further, you got to areas where there actually were these sea urchin barren little areas. So they did exist in the past, um, but in these kind of smaller chunks, generally out further and, and kind of deeper on these reefs. But what we saw, um, and there's um, a whole bunch of other data but, um, in time points in between these two, but basically through the 2000s and 2010s, we get these sea urchin barrens increasing from those deeper edges all the way up into the shallows. And so now here, we've only got bits of seaweeds. Uh, this is in 2014, so this is even <laughs> two years out of date now. Uh, just right up in the shallows. This is kind of about half a metre um, I'm also, and so the wave action and things stops the urchins kind of grazing right up to the to the uh, to the tide line. So most of that reef is now sea urchin barrens, and um, from time to time you get things like olver and other weedy species that might come through. Uh, but for the most part, that's kind of shifted to that sea urchin barren state. And there's also some other work that I was able to find. So um, Spencer from the from the 60s at Williamstown and Point Cook, um, and they had photos in their theses. This is in the University of Melbourne archives. Um, this is a black and white image. There's a bit of golden kelp there and some other greens and reds. Um, and another thesis that also talked about kelp. And the first one, they really talked about sea urchin barrens at a site out at Point Cook. And that was a similar kind of story. It talked about there being kelp in the shallower areas and once you got right out further and deeper, there was some patches of urchin barrens and they counted urchins and they looked at seaweeds and everything. So it was really great data to be able to pull together. And it was a similar kind of story when we looked at, um, this is Point Cook, and this is actually in the now modern day Marine Park um, of some of these urchin barren areas out here at these dots, um, which is where the surveys were done back in the eighties um, with kelp up in the shallows. And then those urchin barrens moving right up into the shallows as we get into the 2000s and 2010s. And the same thing out at Beau Morris, out at Table Rock Point there, um, which is right on the edge of the marine sanctuaries. So a really similar story that we're seeing happening at all three of those sites where we had both the historical data from the field, as well as then looking at these aerial images to see how that was changing and moving at time. Um, so yeah, that's obviously quite a big change. And those changes have for the most part stayed relatively true. We haven't seen the golden kelp come back in any of these sites. Every now and then in particular years, we might get some other um, kind of more ephemeral or kind of weedy species that might come in for a year or so, then they get eaten back by the urchins again. And so we're in this kind of state now where, um, yeah, where these reefs are really struggling to, to recover. Um, and so one of the questions is, well, what is driving this? Um, and is it the sea urchins? Is it something else that's also happening? And um, I put together, and this is quite a bit of a busy graph, so apologies, um, all these black dots. Um, is basically the cover of the seaweed on the, reef, on the reef out at Williamstown there. So that was the first one that I talked about and how that changed over time. And probably in particular, this period here from the 2000s to 2010s is when we really saw that sharp decline. And then we haven't seen much change or recovery since. And that was also timed at the same time where we had the millennium drought. So we had increased water temperatures, reduced nutrients coming into the bay from rainfall. And those are things that kelp Kelp doesn't like too much. Um, but we also saw from the field data that there was also increasing sea urchin densities right at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a bit of a perfect storm between both conditions that aren't great for kelp and increasing sea urchin numbers that we saw from the field data um, that's kind of both combined together into this period through the 2000s and the millennium drought that really drove the decline of, of the kelp and a whole lot of the other seaweeds in the bay. So yeah, have virtual marins existed in the past? Yes, they did, but not to the extent and, uh, um, that we're seeing them. So we're really seeing them run rampant through areas that used to be kelp and uh, or, or, or dominated by, by other macroalgae species. 
The other question is around, are these urchin barren areas widespread? So, you know, that's three particular sites that we've kind of focused in on. What, what's the state of the reefs throughout the rest of the bay? Well, um, Scott Ling from University of Tasmania back uh, around 20, 2012 uh, surveyed a whole lot of sites looking at sea urchin numbers um, and also the, the kelp and mackerel we'll cover. Uh, and these dots here, the larger the dots, the more sea urchins there were at that site. So when you see these really big bubbles, those are areas with lots of sea urchins or, or, or sea urchin biomass. And so we can see these reefs in the north have really big bubbles, so lots of sea urchins, as well as these reefs out in the west as well. And so we see urchin barrens basically from the Geelong Arm through Avalon and, you know, kind of Kirk Point, Werribee, that are really quite bad in some places. And then all the way up through, yeah, yeah we get uh, reefs through Point Cook, Williamstown, Beau Morris, and then also on the Ballerine and Mornington. Um, so a bunch of those reefs, about 50% of them um, are what you would call kind of urchin barrens. Um, so there is a bit of a mixture. So not all sites are, have completely turned, but a lot of the reefs or sites um, through most of the reefs, particularly in that northwestern part of the bay, have been really quite impacted. Um, and we also see this in the, the densities of the golden kelp. So when we look at these graphs, we can see uh, here the bigger bubbles means more kelp. And so we've basically uh, lost most of the kelp, or there's very small patches, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, in this north and this northwestern part. We still have um, a few patches there down in the south. So yeah, this isn't just a problem at a few locations. This is actually something that's playing out uh, more broadly across, across Port Phillip Bay. Um, so yeah, are the urchin barrens widespread? Um, yeah, we are seeing them across more sites than just these um, handful in the north that we're seeing them at a whole lot of locations around the bay. So, okay, next one, what's, so, so what's driving this? And I've kind of hinted at this a little bit in terms of some of those environmental changes that were happening, but there's also the questions like, what exactly is that role of the sea urchin? So we, we have some of the data that urchin numbers were increasing, but is it kind of chicken and egg? Was the kelp declining and then kind of urchins had to change and, and something was happening there? Or was it the urchins that were really driving the kelp decline and actively eating these kelp forests? Um, and so to look into this, um, Nina, who was a PhD student at the University of Tasmania at the time, did some great work looking at um, urchin foraging on kelp. This is a really cool time-lapse video she got um, showing kind of that edge between an urchin barren and, and a kelp bed. Um, and these few urchins here that are starting to play around with the kelp there and then eventually start to break that off. So from a whole lot of her work uh, was really looking at um, how the urchins are feeding on and um, on the kelp um, and what's shifting them from a mode of kind of being passive to more actively feeding on these kelp beds. Um, there's also, and also just from when we were doing <coughs> surveys at these sites and other experiments, we would see fronts of urchins moving through, <coughs> kind of consuming kelp as, as they went. And you'd see them gang tackling the last little straggling bits of kelp and they'd eat that and then kind of move on. And so we definitely saw in the field um, a lot of active consumption of, of kelp and other seaweeds. But we really wanted to know, well, what's the number of urchins that it takes? So, you know, on a normal healthy reef, you do have a certain number of sea urchins. It's usually around two or three or four a square metre. Um, but what, how many does it take until we get these reefs starting to shift from being dominated by kelp to actually them overgrazing and then turning it into an urchin barren. Um, and so, yeah, so um, as part of my PhD, I ran an experiment on this, but also Nina as well. So yeah, what's the recipe? What does it take to make an urchin barren? And you, and you feel quite bad doing this, but um, it's all for science so we can understand what's happening. And we do it on pretty small areas. So just kind of little one, one by one. So what does it take to go from, from a kelp bed to an urchin barren? Um, and so from um, yeah, the research that I did, there was kind of two main pathways that this was happening, that it could actually happen if you lost all the kelp in that little area and just had the same normal number of urchins you'd have on a healthy reef, about two or three a, a square metre. Just by losing that kelp, there's so much less food for the urchins that then they start moving around and grazing everything out. And so that reef that was healthy just by losing the kelp, no increase in urchin numbers, we're getting that shift into an urchin barren. So there's one, so that's one pathway by which we were getting 
these barons kind of being formed. But another one is by adding urchins. So if you add, you know, double or three times the number of urchins, then you do get that also shifting in uh, to that urchin barren state. So, so there's two different ways that this can happen. Um, and, and, and Nina's work, she really uh, delved into how many urchins does it take exactly. Um, so when she did work, so at, 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 at zero urchins, it still was a kelp bed. At four, it was still kelp. And from eight urchins and above per square metre, um, that's, when it, that's when those reefs started uh, becoming urchin barren. So we now have really great numbers in terms of, okay, how many urchins, if we're monitoring healthy reefs, what's the kind of a good number of urchins that we want on that reef as opposed to, wow, if we start seeing above eight, it's, it might only take a few months after that to get that reef now turning into an urchin barren. So we've got really good thresholds now for knowing when, when we might need to act. Um, so, yeah, so I guess really bringing it back to this diagram before. So, yeah, it really is this perfect storm of that we were getting loss of kelp at the same time as increasing urchin numbers and that combination of the two. So it wasn't just the urchins, although they definitely had a big role in it, uh, but there's also this kind of declining environmental conditions, mostly driven by warming, um, that was, yeah, that, that kind of really drove this large scale change. So then I guess, okay, so now we have these reefs um, that are a bunch of urchin barrens. So now what is preventing them from recovering? So even though the urchins in some places might not have caused it to exactly shift in terms of increases, are they stopping it from recovering? Um, and so I guess we kind of did the reverse of those other experiments. So instead of adding urchins to plots, we uh, set up little, little plots with fences, a little bit of urchin gardening, um, and then we'd just take them out, pop them on the other side, and we'd watch what happens when we reduce the number of urchins. Um, so it felt a little bit like the reverse of urchin farms. Um, and so, yeah, what we saw was we really needed to get the urchin numbers really quite low, so less than four a square metre to start to see any seaweeds coming back on that reef, particularly the big brown ones. Um, so this is the, um, another graph here, so showing it's only really at that low urchin numbers, kind of zero to four, that we're getting any seaweed starting to come back. And when we had kind of more than four up to eight, um, which is this yellow line, we didn't get any of those brown seaweeds coming back over about a two year period. Um, and then especially not once, yeah, if we had nine plus urchins per square metre. So, yeah, if we do want to help these reefs out, we do need to knock back the number of urchins that we have on, on the reefs. But that we can actually see recovery, which is really promising. Um, so are sea urchins maintaining barrens? In most cases, yes. There's a few little, few little complexities in there, which I'm more than happy to chat about. But for the most part, um, yeah, the urchins are preventing these reefs from, from uh, recovering. Okay, so getting back to this kind of overarching question, should we be doing something about this? Um, and I guess this is almost the, the, uh, the case uh, for intervention. So going back to our question, so yeah, urchin populations have increased uh, over time and we've seen an expansion of these sea urchin barrens into areas that when we look back through all the aerial imagery and field data didn't used to be barrens in the past. And they've shifted and then they've kind of stayed that way and we haven't seen any recovery. Um, and that it's really difficult, yeah, for these, for these reefs to recover on their own. So without reducing the sea urchin numbers, um, we're not going to see reefs uh, uh, come back. And in many cases, and from, from some of that urchin removal work, um, we might need to do extra things to actually help these reefs along. But that was two years of an urchin exclusion experiment and we only had about 20, 30% cover of some of these bigger brown things. So yeah, if we wanna kind of help speed that up, we might actually have to get a bit more involved. Um, and then of course, just getting back to some of those earlier images that this obviously has a big impact on the biodiversity and then the services, you know, fisheries and diving and things uh, by having these urchin barrens in place that um, especially when we think about the marine parks, their goal is really about maintaining biodiversity. And so when we're getting an increase and expansion of these sea urchin barrens, and that's really impacting the biodiversity in those parks. Um, and so that really led to the next stage, which was around um, in the marine sanctuaries, getting parks rangers and the community involved 
in culling trials. So we've done it in these small little pots that we kind of gardened, uh, but we've kind of gone through um, testing at all different levels. So the first lot of community culls is in larger 10 by 10 meter areas. And then Jill and Emily and the team that um, I'm out at Williamstown have then expanded up into larger and larger plots. And we're seeing um, relatively good recovery at these sites. So going from that urchin barren state, you know, doing these culls, taking, you know, knocking the urchin numbers right down, and we're seeing recovery uh, of, of some of the species. But like I mentioned before, we're not seeing much of the big brown ones coming back, which kind of comes to this driver that we might need to help these reefs out a little bit more to get back some of the big brown kelpie things that we really love. Now, I've just put this slide in here more as a discussion point because I'm definitely out of time. Um, but this is a really good one to chat about what role predators play in the system, uh, either historically or in, or in the future. So, yeah, that's a, I'm, I'm, I'm probably uh, a marking a question. And then, yeah, that leads us to where we are today, um, which is, yeah, realising that we really need to take action in terms of restoring the reefs and helping the kelp out. Um, and the current project um, funded by the state government to yeah, restore kelp and, and, and the reefs in the bay. So on that note, I'll pass over to Prue who will, uh, well, or Peter will pass over to Prue. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so I, don't, I, I can skip a few slides now because you've kind of introduced us. That saves us a few minutes there. That, that's great. But before I do um, flip across, I do want to take note of our project team and uh Paul's already alluded to that team. And we are very rapidly realizing that kelp restoration requires a team. And it will, at some point, we'll call on the community to join that team because it's uh, we're going to need everybody hands on deck to help us out. Um, so recognizing that it's really unique, this project, because it does have... Um, I guess the, the leading experts in Victoria that in that research space, the management space, but also the restoration space working together to try and um, bring back the kelp. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a sort of a bit of an overview of what this Golden Kelp Restoration Project is all about, what our main goals and aims are of this particular project, and then some of the methodology or the approaches that we're going about it and then finish off with a video because everyone loves a video. Uh, and I can talk you through some of the, oh, I'll show you footage of growing baby kelp because that's really cool in itself. So the first goal really is, as um, Paul's already pointed out, is to improve the biodiversity. And so it, particularly in those areas that we've already seen the devastating impact of those urchin barrens and trying to facilitate the recovery of golden kelp, but also macroalgae in general. And we are focusing on two locations within Port Phillip Bay, so Jawbone and also Ricketts. And I'm sure many of you are very familiar with those two locations and snorkel there quite often. So there are two target sites that we're focusing focusing on for this particular restoration project, but also noting that uh, we would love to sort of expand beyond that into the future. The other goal is also to protect remnant kelp forests. So those that are already there and that you might snorkel and go out and, and visit now, making sure that we can protect those by doing the urchin management and the culling of those, and then hoping that by that protection, it's encouraging that natural recruitment of kelp in the meantime. So it's not actually, it's what we call passive uh, restoration. Then the third aim or goal is to support the recovery of um, of the golden kelp, obviously, but through what we call passive and active restoration. So passive, just generally, really speaking, is that natural recruitment. So sort of trying to cull back the urchins and so allowing for that recruitment to naturally grow. And in the instances that we're starting to see in the bay that we've tried that, it's working a little bit, but we need to do more because it's not going to the impact that we would like it to see and like it to the point that there's a kelp forest back in those areas again. So this is where the Golden Kelp Project is, is coming into play, where we're now bringing in what we call active restoration. And that is where it's, it's using human intervention or science uh, to come into these areas to give the kelp a bit of a helping hand. So that's what I'm going to talk um, more broadly to today. So our approach, as we mentioned, we're doing the urchin uh, management, and that is largely led by the Parks Victoria team. So the idea is to cull within four hectares across both those sanctuaries um, and achieve a, that target that Paul's just mentioned of the two urchins per metre squared to help that passive um, and active recovery of kelp. 
The other approach is the to do research and development into cultivation and restoration, and that is uh, Deacon and TNC leading that. So that's, I guess, where we put my Deacon hat on and talk to. So the cultivation of seaweed is quite difficult in itself. Uh, seaweed, even though it grows relatively quickly like a terrestrial plant would, it has a complicated life history. And so to try and close that life history under laboratory conditions, to try and simulate an ocean world is uh, quite difficult, but we are lucky enough that the golden kelp, Aclonia radiata, has already been closed the life cycle by other scientists in, um, in Australia. So we've been able to modify their approach and make it specific to the kelp that we've got in the bay. So we've been working in the lab trying to refine that optimization of cultivating it. So that's you know, growing <laughs> and then uh, gardening, I guess ocean gardening in a way, and then putting it out into the bay and out for what we call out planting. And so again, that requires R&D, research and development to try and work out what the best best method of that active restoration is. And so we're trialing two known methods for Port Phillip Bay, and that is green gravel and twine. And I can um, show you what that looks like. So I think that's some of the questions we get sometimes is what is green gravel and what is twine? Uh, green gravel, it sounds really um, fancy, doesn't it? But it's just rock. <laughs> so we're growing uh, sporophytes, little baby kelp onto these. And then the twine that we've got is uh, natural twine that's biodegradable. And yes, we go to Bunnings a lot as science. This is a PVC pipe, and yes, that is a cable tie. Where would we be without cable ties? So the twine's literally wrapped around this PVC, PVC piping, and we grow the golden kelp onto this, and then this is then deployed out into the ocean. So again, uh, this has mixed success depending on where you are in the world, and because Port Phillip Bay has its own urban uh, Im impact or, or the way that it's structured is that we're trialling these two different methods to see if one might be better suited to Port Phillip Bay than the other. It could also be very location site specific too. So that's hence why we're trialling rickets and jawbone. So that's the restoration or the, the cultivation. Again, I've got some imagery of what that looks like shortly. So you can see it from start to finish because it's quite a, a very interesting process and a fun process to do in the lab and then out into the field. The last approach is then once the urchins have been managed or culled that uh, the University of Melbourne team come in and monitor it. So they do before and an after of that urchin management, but then also we're managing and monitoring what the outplanting of the kelp is, how that's going before and after as well. And so we've already had our first outplanting deployment in Jawbone, and we're just now collecting the data uh, from that too. So all of these approaches is a really big team effort between all of us um, project partners. So now to the fun video. So I'll just press play and I'll just talk over the top of this. Uh, so we get to go snorkeling, which is fun. Uh, so we have to go out and collect reproductive kelp. So we go out and collect what we call the sauri. It's a darker patch on the blade itself. And that's us um, collecting that now, holding up going, yes, we found it because we got really excited. Then it's, we take it back to what we call boot science in the back of the car and cut it all up to what we need. And so what we're doing here is basically is isolating the reproductive part of the plant or the seaweed. And that way we can take it back to the lab and stress it out a little bit to try and induce it to be, become reproductive. And the first part of the reproductive part is inside the, the tissue or the seaweed itself that you can see here. It has little tiny spores that will come out and it'll come out once you put it back into the seawater. Yes, that is betadine, what you would put on a cut, that, that brownie sort of stuff. That's uh, actually cleaning the epiphytes or little bits that are growing on the seaweed that we don't want in our cultures because we want it nice and clean culture so they grow lovely. And so we it basically induce the reproductive tissue. So those spores, that's the first stage of their development, come out. And then those little spores, we can then seed onto either our twine or our gravel, and then we can grow them in laboratory conditions, as you can see here on the screen. So this is all growing down at our Queenscliff Marine Science Centre, uh, where we um, have our incubator here, where we can grow <laughs> these little gametophytes. You can't really see them up close, but I can assure you there's a lot in there, that little vial itself. And this is uh, our lovely RA Jazz, who is seeding the little spores onto the gravel before. This is what it looks like before, pile of rocks. <laughs> and then six to eight weeks later, we will see the, so they go from spores to what we call gametophytes. And those gametophytes are then a male and a female. 
And then from there, the males will release their sperm and then they'll fertilize that gametophyte, which then turn into what we see when we're out snorkeling, a sporophyte. So this is the sporophyte. That's roughly about six to eight weeks old, really close up on one of the gravel there. And aren't that cute? <laughs> Absolutely adorable. And again, this is before the twine. You wouldn't even know that something's being put on that twine. And then six to eight weeks later, we'll start to see the adult, the early stage of that adult stage, the sporophyte. And that's at six to eight weeks. So that's at the point that we then take them out plant into the sites that we've chosen. And again, you can sort of see them up close, just a concept of size for you. These are a little bit older. We kept them in the lab for a bit longer just to see how they would go. So I'm going to guess maybe at this stage they're about 10 to 12 feet, so they're a little bit bigger. But then you start seeing them with naked eye. And so this is Scott <laughs> from TNC out diving and doing the fun, fun job of unraveling all that twine and out, what we call out planting. So we've got our plots already located at Jawbone. So if you've been snorkeling out there and have come across some weird looking floats, uh, that's where our little kelplings are currently growing out there on either the twine or the gravel. So that's it in a snapshot. So what we're trying to do at the moment is um, experimentally see which one is better or not which one is better, but is, is gravel working in that site or is twine working in that site? And then we're going to replicate that again across at Ricketts. So we actually haven't started any active restoration at Ricketts just yet. That will be next year. So this year has just been a focus at Jawbone.